Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Medieval Beginnings, a new close reading series from the London Review of Books. I'm Mary Wellesley, a contributor to the paper, and I'm delighted to be back for this series with another contributor to the paper, Irina Dumitrescu, who teaches medieval literature at the University of Bonn. Our opening episode is about Beowulf, the great epic of early English literature. Set during a mythic 6th century Scandinavian past, it tells a story of heroic deeds and heroic failures in what Seamus Heaney called an honour-bound and blood-stained society. The poem survives in a single manuscript that was nearly destroyed in the 18th century, but has survived into the present day. Today, Beowulf is a work both widely studied and visible in popular culture. We will be doing some readings from the poem in the Old English, but also in Seamus Heaney's translation, if you want to follow along. OK, Irina, how do we begin? I mean, perhaps the first question should be, what kind of a poem is Beowulf? I think most people think of Beowulf as a monster story. That's how it's usually depicted in movies. That's the most obviously cinematic quality. You have a great hero, stronger and burlier than all the other men in his time. He successfully rids a hall of two terrifying semi-human monsters, Grendel and Grendel's mother, both of whom have a propensity for eating people. And then at the end of his life, after a long reign as king of his Geatish folk, he winds up fighting the dragon who is setting fire to all the settlements and dying in that fight. So that's the general idea most people have of Beowulf, and it's fair because it is structured around these three monster fights. But at the same time, Beowulf is a story about people, and it's a story about people who make war and the way that war is endless. And in the way that it's remained to us, it's also a story about the things we don't know. There's so much we don't know about this poem. We don't know who the author was or really how it was even composed, if we have to think of an oral composition, uh, some kind of collective writing of the poem over years of stories being passed down. We don't know at what date the poem took the shape that it has now. Scholars have argued for everything between the 7th and the 11th century, which is a little bit like not knowing whether the wasteland was written in the 20th century or in the 16th century. I mean, we can see that it's a really wide range of time. One thing that we do know is that it's a kind of historical fiction. So it's written in English, but there are no English characters in it. Um, It's set in early 6th century Scandinavia. A number of the characters seem to have been known from historical materials. Beowulf is not. Beowulf is a completely fictional character as far as we can tell. So he's inserted into this historical context. But again, it's hard to tell how much the whatever the first contemporary English audience of Beowulf would have known about the Scandinavian history. A lot of that history has been reconstructed by scholars today, but we can't necessarily assume anything about it. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's really a collection of mysteries. uh, And, you know, the most basic facts about the poem, like, should we see it as having one single author, for example, um, are just utterly unknown. And scholars continue to debate that. So we've got very few kind of concrete details. I suppose we do have at least the manuscript itself, which we think was copied about 1000. We think it was probably copied in the south of England. We can be sure it was copied by two scribes. That's about all we can be really sure about with the manuscript. I suppose in some ways it's a bit like a modern bookshelf rather than the the physical manuscript itself is like a modern bookshelf in that it contains several texts alongside Beowulf uh, that don't necessarily relate to Beowulf. So we've got a homily on St. Christopher. We've got a text called The Marvels of the East, which has got some wonderful uh, drawings in it, um, some illumination. And then we've got this fantastic poem about the apocryphal Judith, which describes this amazing heroine who is, uh, has incredible courage and also an elvish beauty. And chops off heads. That's important for Beowulf, too. Yeah, she chops off heads. And, um, and you know, there is St. Christopher is a kind of dog-headed saint who's sort of semi-monstrous. So there's, there are some kind of uh, themes that are sl- somewhat suggested by the text that appear alongside Beowulf. The story of the manuscript itself is is 
kind of an extraordinary one because it was pretty much unknown until uh, the 18th century when there was a very brief description of it made by a man called Humphrey Wanley. And then in the 18th century, it was stored in the ominously named Ash Burnham House. And this is an important lesson, by the way. Never put your books in a place called Ash Burnham House. Right. And on the 23rd of October, 1731, a fire broke out in the apartments on the floor below the library. And um, many, many manuscripts in this extraordinary collection that was put together by a man named Robert Cotton during the Elizabethan period were destroyed. And those that did survive many of them, according to the parliamentary report of what happened that night, were actually thrown out of the window. And a Beowulf, the manuscript of Beowulf is extraordinary because it has these singed edges to its folios, um, a kind of testament to how the fire very nearly destroyed the poem. And the important point is that in 1731, there was no edition of the poem and there was no complete transcription of it. So this was the sole surviving copy. And in itself, it's significant because it represents about a tenth of the surviving corpus of Old English verse. So just on, on a purely numbers basis, it's tremendously important. So let's let's kind of dive into the story a little, perhaps, and let's begin at the beginning. So what happens at the beginning of Beowulf? Well, the funny thing is Beowulf doesn't begin with Beowulf. It begins with a man named Schildschafing, uh, who comes out of nowhere. He's an orphan, a foundling. Uh, we know nothing about his genealogy. And he seems to be a man on a mission to prove himself. He terrifies all the people around him, establishes dominance over the neighboring peoples, and sets himself up as a king. Uh, so he's an interesting figure because he's he's a strong man type. And the poet says that was a good king. That was God Kuning, uh, which we can decide whether we take that straight or or ironically. And that's a phrase that that's a phrase that comes up several times in the poem. It's almost like a little bit of a refrain, and sometimes it does appear to have this kind of ironic ring to it, doesn't it? Well, it's the poem starting to ask right at the beginning what makes for a good king. It's a fair question because Schild's descendants are not the same kinds of kings they are. Um, he founds a line, and eventually one of his descendants is Hrothgar, who builds a great hall, builds relationships with people. The hall is a symbol of human order. It's a place of peace, a place uh, where diplomacy is done. It's a sense of civilization and also joy and pleasure. And then we get Schild's funeral. Um, it's a beautiful ship funeral. Uh, he is basically laden onto the boat um, with treasures and sent back out to sea. And nobody knows what happens to him after that. Okay, so it's a ship funeral, right? So we're not talking about a Christian funeral, right? No, it's... Even though we're talking about a poem that was written down in a manuscript clearly created in a Christian context, most likely in a monastic context, you know, in around 1000, by which time Christianity is very well established in, in England. So what do we make of that? What we make of it is that the poet is almost certainly a Christian poet, but who has a generous perspective on the people he's writing about. So they're clearly pagans, and sometimes they do pagan, bad, naughty pagan things, like <laughs> they're sacrificing to idols. And it's clear that that's not a good thing to do. Um, they don't have Christian faith. At the same time, we're not confronted with troubling pagan practices. It's There's a sense that their funerals are not Christian funerals. At the end, we'll see that uh, Beowulf is cremated. That was something that Christians did not like to do. But they're not so different. They could have been made more different. And you know, one argument is that they weren't made that different because then they wouldn't have been as sympathetic to the English readers. But what's interesting to me is that the poem begins with an ending, in a sense. And I think that it makes us think about gaps and thinks about what's not known right at the start of the poem. And to also think about sort of circularity. I mean, I think one of the things that we should say perhaps at the outset about this poem is it, it doesn't have this neat linear narrative. Um, it's Heaney has this wonderful phrase where he says, you're going along with a narrative and then suddenly it feels as though you've channel surfed into a totally different narrative. And it's true, there are all of these uh, interjections where a certain history is recalled, or there are moments when the poet looks forward to a 
events that are going to happen later. And it's sometimes very difficult to kind of keep track of where we are, especially towards the end of the poem where we have these digressions into the Swedish wars and we feel a little bit disconcerted and a little bit lost. But I think perhaps sometimes a way to think about this is to think about the design of Anglo-Saxon interlace art. So the kinds of artwork that we see in uh, the manuscript decoration of the Anglo-Saxon period and the jewelry created in the Anglo-Saxon period, these wonderful interweaving threads that look like a kind of confusing mess from the outside. But when you get in close, you suddenly start to see the complexity that's there in front of you. And I think that's perhaps a helpful way to think about the form and structure of this poem. It does seem very strange to begin with a funeral, but slowly as you go along, the purpose of that unfolds for the reader. Thanks for listening to this extract from Medieval Beginnings, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.